Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails Common Ground. I'm Malva Kajali, the events assistant here at The Rail. And today I have the pleasure and privilege of welcoming Meryl Agish and Lori Wallach from the Queen's Memory Project, alongside Denise Milstein and Ryan Hagen from the NYC COVID-19 Oral History, Narrative and Memory Archive on this, the one year anniversary of the COVID-19 outbreak in New York City. Kind of crazy to think this was all a year ago, but this is sort of where we were in terms of this week. Um, we're also so lucky to have the poet Connie May Concepcion Oliver here with us today, who will read to close today's program. Uh, we've traditionally started off all our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we're on the unceded land and waters of Lenapehoking, which still belongs to the Wappinger, Canarsi, Munsi, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. Although we have for many events named many of those that have lost their lives to police violence and white supremacy in this country, I want to dedicate today's program to Breonna Taylor, who was murdered in her sleep by police a year ago, just this past week on March 13th. The past year has demanded our attention, that there is much to learn and to unlearn encountering the legacies of white settler colonialism and white supremacy in this country and in finding our path to liberation. I encourage you all to check the chat for a living document of resources that we've been collecting that should be dropped in there shortly. Um, and you know, today I'm joined by Meryl Agish, the community coordinator of the Queen's Memory Project and Lori Wallach, the Queen's Memory Coordinator at Queen's College, who work together on their project, Queen's Memory, the Community Archive and Oral History Collection of the Queen's Public Library and Queen's College uh, CUNY. They're joined, they're joined by Denise Milstein, a writer and researcher whose current projects focus on urban dwellers' access to nature in NYC public spaces, the use of near obsolete technologies, uh, and New Yorkers' experiences with the pandemic through the NYC COVID-19 Oral History Narrative and Memory Archive over at Columbia, which she co-directs with Ryan Hagen, who's also joining us here today, a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Sociology, at Columbia, who's currently working on a book about how organizations anticipate disaster and how people manage and mitigate risk. Uh, you can read fuller bios for today's guests uh, in the chat, should be dropped shortly, but to everyone, welcome. How are you doing? Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. How's everyone's morning? Um, how's everyone doing? Pretty well, just very glad to be here and glad to hear more about uh, the Queen's Memory Project and excited to talk about our own work and excited to hear questions from everyone else. Okay, amazing. Well, before we move uh, to the formal presentations, I'd love to ask sort of where is everyone tuning in from? Can you locate us in the city? And uh, where were you, like, can you re re recollect where were you this time last year? Well, Maybe I can start, start by uh, saying that I was, I am not in the city right now. Uh, I'm in Armenia, um, but I do live in oh, Harlem. Wow. That's where I was a year ago. I'm only here for, for a couple of days. Um, I was in Harlem with my teenage son uh, in shock because uh, we had just heard that school would not reopen uh, after the weekend. And so, um, and beginning to think with Ryan about this project that we'll talk about today. I'm, I'm in Kew Gardens, Queens, and a year ago was in Kew Gardens, Queens, and in a different corner of this apartment with uh, similarly in shock with my then two-year-old daughter whose daycare was suddenly shut down and her routine was completely <laughs> upended along with all of ours and it's hard to kind of place myself back in that first week um, just trying to wrap my head around everything. Um, I'm in New Haven, Connecticut and I about a year ago was sitting probably in this exact same chair in this exact same position thinking about the pandemic uh, as it was unfolding. I usually commuted into New York City uh, up into Morningside Heights uh, by train, but um, the university had basically shut down by now um, and gone remote. And so I was already here and um, 
in again also as everyone else a state of shock but i had been in that state for some time i think the the day that um of the former president's uh oval office address was kind of the day that i freaked out because i realized um, how out of control this pandemic was going to get with no federal response in any meaningful way so um that's where i was yeah, and um, I, I'm similarly, I'm, I'm on Long Island right now in Wantaw, Long Island, which is where I was also a year ago. And um, CUNY had shut down, I guess, about a week before this. And we were in this uh, weird recalibration period where um, we were trying to figure out how to switch to remote learning, which we thought would be just something we do for a few weeks. And, and here we still are doing it. So it was kind of a, a little in-between space. And uh, my husband also works for CUNY, he's a professor, and we were both trying to figure out what are our jobs gonna be going forward. And, and I think we're still trying to figure that out actually. Thank you all so much. Um, yeah, I feel like uh, Meryl and Lori, uh, I think it would be great to hear sort of what uh, the earliest inception of the Queen's Memory COVID project was like. Like, what were you thinking in those early weeks? And should we should we start the presentation? Sure. Yeah. We have just a very brief intro to Queen's Memory before we turn to the yeah. COVID nineteen project. Yeah. So. Um, Queen's Memory um, actually has been a digital archive all along. We've been a community digital archive since our beginning, which was in 2010. Um, we were actually started by our director, Natalie Milbrot, when she was a grad student at Queen's College as an oral history project. And it took off from there. And, and now, as you mentioned in the beginning, um, we're jointly administered by Queen's Public Library and Queen's College. Um, we have been a community archive since the beginning. Uh, obviously, we had done a lot more in-person events and focused on events in the branch libraries and at the college and at different communities. So um, that's where we started. And as we've gone into the COVID-19 project, our, our methods have, have changed quite a bit. Yeah, if you go to the next slide, please. So. It was about maybe not exactly a year ago, maybe a few days into that first week of shutdown that um, as Lori mentioned, you know, trying to figure out, well, what, what is our job and what is our role? Uh, we're an archive for the borough of Queens, for the people of Queens. And it felt like we needed to answer a very urgent need. Um, from a year ago when our borough was the epicenter of the epicenter, you kept hearing that. There was one New York Times story that for me really clinched it in my mind. Uh, I believe it was published March 25th, March 26th about how 13 people had died at Elmhurst Hospital. And I was noticing my own reaction and other people who I know in the community reacting to who, who are these people? They're our neighbors, they're people who we live alongside and we have no concept of who is falling victim so early. Um, and very quickly after that, you know, it was no longer 13 people dying a day, it was dozens and dozens. And I think the need that I felt most urgently was just trying to make sense of what we were going through, not just as a borough, not just as a project, but that everybody was being affected in some way. And so very quickly, uh, we launched on April 9th of last year, it just took a little time to get everything in place. But you know, all things considered, we got it together really, really fast. And we made an open call for first person stories in any digital format. So, you know, text photos, videos, we've received scans of paintings, uh, scans of handmade books that a first grader has made. And we've also been recording oral history interviews remotely throughout this time. And um, for the rest of the presentation, we'll be going through a couple of um, selections just to give you a sense of the types of stories that we've collected, the types of interviews that we've recorded. Um, and I'll be sharing these slides afterwards too so that <laughs> hopefully you'll all have a chance to dig in a little bit more. We, um, 
have a lot that you could get lost in. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, so, so these submissions were from Lynette Rojas, who is actually an undergrad student at Queens College. She's in the, the SEEK program. Um, and she submitted a, a bunch of photos that were basically documenting her life at home. Suddenly she, you know, she had been coming to campus every day and enjoying that experience. And suddenly she found herself um, on remote learning. And you see the smaller picture there is also her little brother who was forced into remote learning as well. Um, that's that's the view from her apartment, I believe. She's in Jackson Heights. Um, so she she gave sent in a few pictures of that, and even though she seemed a bit frustrated by the whole experience, she also accompanied it with a a really nice first person essay where she was reflecting on um, how much help her family was getting and how neighbors were being very helpful and there were a lot of resources available to them and she was very impressed by that and grateful for that. So that was kind of a nice perspective. And that was that was pretty early on. That was um, late April or early May. So before the semester had even ended, she was um, sending that in. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, yes, this is Professor Nicole Aluki, who is actually one of our first um, oral interviews that we did. Um, we interviewed him April 6th. Uh, my colleague, Obdin Mandazir, in interviewed him for the archives. Um, Nicola was a a in a unique position to speak to us because as you see the quote that we have here, he, uh, on the one hand, he was reflecting on what it was like to suddenly be thrust into this um, remote teaching environment. And he's a language professor. He teaches um, Italian classes. So he was finding it, you know, sort of difficult and frustrating to try to teach a language class suddenly all online, which as he remarks here, um, he basically felt like he was teaching to a bunch of empty boxes. But at the same time, he is from Cremona in uh, Lombardy, Italy, where his family, most of his family still is. And that was the early epicenter in Italy and Europe of COVID. And so at the same time that he was trying to adapt to his job, he was extremely worried about his parents and, and his friends and family. So he is kind of balancing both things and, and, and straddling both worlds. It was a very interesting interview that he gave us remotely, which was probably one of our first um, Zoom interviews. And next slide. And Alexis Ward is here with us. So Alexis, if you can unmute yourself and chime in here. Oh, right. Yeah. So, so uh, when I, when I came across like this program last year, it was basically a great way to like cope because I went all of a sudden from being in a studio space with all of my fellow artists, fellow classmates to being at, being at home. And that felt very isolating. So I felt that this was a great resource to be, to really get to express and to share so that it doesn't feel like we're all alone. So basically I was able to create different kinds of work where it wasn't, it was my class assignment, like the one in the corner, but also it was very specific where dealing with COVID, this is not the flu. And that one came like as like an impulse, like more just like, what do I initially feel? How am I initially feeling? And it felt like therapeutic in a way to be able to record and to and to do that. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and um, so this was uh, these were some submissions from So Young too who is a professor of English at Queens College. And um, just she likewise saw our call for submissions that, that we tried to circulate to the college community and really everywhere that we could, mostly through social media. And she, um, as she mentions in this, this um, bit of poetry that she submitted, she was actually um, a recovering agoraphobe at the beginning of the pandemic. And she was very concerned with how all this isolation was going to affect her. And she submitted a bunch of pictures. That's a self portrait that you see there. She submitted a bunch of pictures from her walks that she tried to, you know, kind of force herself to go out on walks every once in a while around Flushing. 
And she gave us a whole bunch of, of photos of feral cats that she found in different parts of Flushing as she was walking, which is really interesting. And how she kind of connected with them and, and kept track of them as she, as she walked from day to day. Um, next slide. So um, for So Young and a few others who submitted, we followed up with them afterwards to see if they would wanna participate in an oral history interview. And so Seo Young was interviewed shortly after by a new volunteer of ours, Jamie Beckenstein. Uh, and I think that has been an entry point for a lot of people coming to the project as volunteers who want to be conducting interviews or helping with the interview process in some way. And also for people who are already submitting their stories to just you know, go even deeper through that oral history process. And one of the real highlights of the last year was we produced the second season of the Queen's Memory podcast. Um, the core team were all initially new volunteers who then we were able to pay thanks to a New York Community Trust Grant, which was really wonderful. And, and that allowed us to make something that sounded you know, really <laughs> wonderful professional quality that uh, for those of us who were launching this project, trying to figure out the world of remote recording, connecting with the community in this very isolated way, um, that team was able to do so much in addition to everything else that was going on with this project. So here you see Rob Semple and Diana Wilson who are two first responders who were interviewed by our, one of our producers, Sam Riddell. And uh, I, I believe we have about 10 episodes, 11 episodes of this podcast. I think this would be one to really start with. Um, I believe it's the fifth one and they go into their experiences of what it was like. Diana had been a first responder during 9-11. She had lost her husband during this time. She was isolating from her children. And Rob was in their first year of being with the fire department and finding it to be incredibly isolated. Uh, not having a real support system. So those full interviews are now a part of our collection. And then the produced version in these podcast episodes show how we're able to use oral histories and then expand on them in this other type of format. So total shout out to that team. They did a wonderful job. Uh, next slide, please. And Patricia too is um, yeah. an ICU nurse who started sending us photos early, early on in our project. As you see, the photos go between March 29th and April 19th. So if you recall, that was really the worst time in the hospitals here. And she then started sending us video diaries that she was recording. It was her way of connecting with her friends, her family, and then she was sending them to us too. And she was also interviewed by Jamie for a longer oral history interview. Um, I won't be able to share the video right now, but please, click on this too, because it is incredible. Um, just getting the first person view of what it was like a year ago, a little less than a year ago um, in the hospitals and getting it directly from her experience. Uh, next slide, please. And so here, just very briefly, we wanted to share just a few more selections of the types of images and stories that we were getting. Uh, early on, you know, it was a lot of adjusting, a lot of, I think, kind of panic and terror that people were experiencing. And you can see that in the early submissions. It was, you know, these signs that suddenly appear and they're hand-drawn. It was that sudden, we just need to close, as you see in that first one by Joplini Franco. Um, we're closing for the safety of our customers and employees. We don't know when we'll open again. I'm not sure if that business has reopened. Um, and these feelings of having to wear masks, the dread of wearing masks, of being around people who are also wearing masks. You know, what Leslie says there in the middle piece, I will miss seeing people's faces. I think that still definitely applies. <laughs> and Megan Green is a professional photographer in Astoria who's been sending, early on, she was sending a lot of photos around Astoria, just of these different touches that she was noticing. Uh, one in particular that really struck me, um, it's not here, but it was this kind of sunset photo with a fence and one of the signs that were put up by the parks department on the playgrounds, just as a disclaimer that this is not being sanitized. And as the parent of a young child seeing that and 
not even having access to those types of spaces, you know, is um, very upsetting. Uh, but next slide, please. And then a few more here, just to show kind of the creative approaches that people were taking and have been taking in their submissions. Stolen's uh, submission, he was doing a series of selfies, uh, these, you know, edited selfies. And he also included a really long text piece about how he was feeling. This is from early on in April. And it's really paralleled, I think, by So Young's submission earlier with the face shield. And just what he says here um, of the awkwardness of being in space and being really scared to be close to people, but not being able to have space because of the nature of our life here in the city. You know, this feeling of all being scared of dying, of killing, of spreading something invisible to a stranger or a loved one, I think we can all um, certainly relate to. And Fei Wang's photo here, she sent in a few photos around flushing, but this one is paired with another one of a kind of grassy path that she would take to her high school it's pictured here and I thought this too was so evocative what she writes that all of a sudden the school's there the lights are still on but nothing is there anymore you know now they're going to be returning soon so hopefully <laughs> things will feel a little bit better for her but you know that was something that I thought was really lovely um, and then I think this is our last slide coming up and then a few more, just photos of relief and joy. Yeah. Um, yeah, Lori, if you want to. Yeah. Oh, I just want a, a little bit of hope. Uh, that picture on the top, uh, Tina Minnelli is um, also an, a, a professor, an adjunct professor at Queens College. And um, this is from May, so really still fairly early on, but it's um, the first time that her family got together. Um, she, she had written about how Sunday dinner was very important for her family and they, their extended family had always gathered for Sunday dinner and that was suspended. And this was the first time in May that there was nice weather and they decided to try an outdoor socially distanced mass gathering and, and how happy they were just to, to kind of be together again and, and continue that tradition. And Neely Ness, whose photo is on the bottom, she sent in about 30 photos of different food that had been delivered to her. Uh, left at her door it, and she also included this lovely story about how she's checked in on a neighbor who was in her early 70s and this neighbor was very adamant about no I you know I was always I think she says something like I was always a giving hand not a taking hand but Neely insisted no please let me help you so Neely started to do grocery shopping for her neighbor and in exchange her neighbor would give these incredible <laughs> homemade uh, yeah. meals and they develop this symbiotic relationship, as Neely mentions in that excerpt, that there's a reason to check in on each other and to see how they're doing and to take care of each other in the ways that they're able to during that time. And for Linda, she's a young photographer from uh, an Ecuadorian family in Corona. And she submitted, I think about 12 photos, maybe more from this walk that she took in mid-April last year where she was trying to capture not just the, the loneliness and the emptiness of that space, which is kind of in an industrial border between the neighborhoods, so it tends to be empty, but she was looking for like these pops of color, this incredible spring feeling. And I think even with those isolated walks in isolated spaces, you know, there's still a lot of beauty that was around us. Um, we got many photos of blooms around April and May of last year, because I think people were just so happy to have something that would give us hope. Um, and then just last slide very briefly. Um, as I mentioned, I'll share these slides with everybody afterwards. So please click through if you want to get in touch, queensmemory at queenslibrary.org. Those messages will be directed to me or to Lori or to anyone yeah, who can really help out. Right. And follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Queen's Memory. <laughs> we have a bunch of events coming up. We have volunteer orientations, interviewing workshops, um, just a ton of stuff. So everything's please. still remote at this point. Yeah, we hope to see you. And thank you. That's that's it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you do such beautiful work over at Queen's Memory, and I, I I just think it's amazing how you can capture like so much of the resilience and the interdependency, and you know. I really feel like there have been all these beautiful scenes that have come out of the past year, like 
really recently my my mother sent me something on whatsapp uh she and all of our neighbors were like doing a bonfire um with like s'mores and things but they all had these they custom ordered these very long 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 social distance sticks <laughs> and were like standing over the fence you know all leaning and i was like that's incredible you know the way people can break down you know take literally take down fences to have a kind of togetherness um I don't know. I, I do want to ask you really quickly, and maybe this is a question for Lori, uh, but I, I feel like obviously you were doing Queen's Memory in advance of in advance of the the COVID outbreak, um, yeah. and how do you think you had to change your sort of like methodology for crowdsourcing materials for your archive, or were you uniquely set up because you were already on the ground doing this beautiful community uh, history work? Well, we, I think we did have the groundwork laid for that. We were doing, we were doing that type of thing anyway. But like I said, um, most of our events were in person. So we were used to sort of inviting people to come in and, and, and do workshops. And, and I was presenting in physical classes at, at the college. So all of a sudden to try to figure out, well, how do we reach these people um, without that physical component? That, that There was a challenge there. We, we, we had always made use of social media, but we had to switch really hard to that being our, our total model right away. And I think it took us a few weeks to kind of to get our bearings. Um, like I said, we had to switch to remote interviewing, which is something we had never done before. In fact, we had sort of thought, oh no, that, that's not the best way to do it. In person is best. And suddenly everything was um, you know, on Zoom and, and Google Voice. We tried a bunch of different platforms. So. You know, um, it was a real pivot. It, it, it took, a, a, I would say, a few weeks just to kind of get up and running. And, and, and I think we're still learning how to reach people. Yeah. yeah. But it's gorgeous. I mean, I definitely recommend yeah. checking out their Instagram. They have beautiful podcasts. Uh, it's just been like a beautiful, uh, like, iteration of the work you do. Um, and I think this is like a really interesting place to transition, perhaps, to Ryan and Denise in the uh, COVID-19 oral history archive that is being worked on at Columbia because um, I feel so excited to have all of you here in conversation with us today because you all do the important work of like preserving the stories and experiences of our communities, our neighbors, all of us here in the city. Um, and I'm especially interested and intrigued because it seems that uh, each one of you has come to it from a different route. So uh, Denise, my understanding is that I uh, you know, you, the two of you didn't start out as oral historians, community historians, but you found it to be like a useful methodology for what you wanted to take on or what you felt the moment demanded? Yes, certainly. And um, maybe before I go into it, into that, I just want to say how incredible it is to hear about the Queen's Memory Project and um, how much of what you've shared um, resonates with my own experience and I'm sure also Ryan's experience with this project, uh, the struggle to reach out to people, having lost the capacity of uh, to, re to reach out to people, um, and then also just the experience of encountering uh, other people's lives and other people's ways of getting through the pandemic, um, the both the painful uh, parts of that and then the hopeful and beautiful parts of that. Um, I'll just say very quickly, just as a, an introduction to our project, that um, we have been gathering oral histories of New Yorkers for the past year. Uh, and with uh, generous support from the National Science Foundation, we've been able to interview 186 people, most of them twice. All of that has been done remotely over the past year. Uh, and then in addition to that, we've collected hundreds and hundreds of chronicles. Uh, so we don't have any visual material, um, which it, I, I think is incredible that the Queen's Memory Project has gathered that kind of material, uh, but we certainly have a lot of audio and video and written material. Um, we've been doing this with a group of people that combines um, my work, Ryan's work, uh, Peter Behrman's work as a sociologist, and the work of or oral historians. Uh, in particular, I just want to say their names because they've been so important uh, in co-directing this project with us, Mary Marshall Clark, Amy Starczewski, and Nissa Chow. And then in addition to that, 
Uh, we've worked with a group of about 20 interviewers. A few of them are here with us in this Zoom room. Uh, and then of course, the people we've interviewed who are also a few of them in this room. So I just want to acknowledge them. Um, so yes, a year ago, Ryan and I started talking with each other about what was happening. Uh, my, what I remember is that we were both um, kind of astounded at how quickly our perception was transforming. And uh, we wanted to register that not just for ourselves, um, but for uh, people in the community around us. And when I say community, I guess I mean the really uh, broad community of New York City, which is what we ended up focusing on. Um, we came to this as sociologists, as ethnographers, uh, Ryan had done work on disaster management, and he'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and I have done a lot of work on culture and politics at the intersection of culture and politics. We both have the tools of ethnographers, and we were both really curious about oral history. And when we started talking with oral historians, especially Amy Starczewski and Mary Marshall Clark, uh, we realized that um, the sort of openness of oral history interviews, uh, the ways in which they give agency to the people being interviewed to talk about what interests them most, uh, to, to allow them to um, direct the conversation in the way that they think is important, reflecting on their own experience. We thought that that was a, um, really important to the kind of work that we wanted to do. Um, so the people we interviewed come from all walks of life. Uh, we have teachers, healthcare workers, unhoused people, midwives, parents. We have frontline workers, but also people who were quarantined from all different parts of the city. And they range very broadly in terms of race, ethnicity, age, lifestyle. Um, we come to the interviews with a set of questions, but we let them unfold following the lead of the people that we're interviewing. Um, something else I want to say before I share a couple of excerpts with you is that this is actually the first time that we share any of the material from the archive. We're very excited about this. Uh, we think it's, it's a great privilege to be able to do it. Can't think really of a better venue in which to do it. Uh, so thank you to the Brooklyn Rail and to Malvika especially for that. Um, we've asked permission from the people whose interviews we're sharing, and that's part of our practice. Um, it's really important, we think, for the people who have contributed their stories to have um, as much say as possible over what happens with their stories um, and the context in which they're presented. So um, I chose two excerpts today that reflect the experiences of people of Chinese descent in particular. Uh, and in the early months of the pandemic, both because it seems really urgent right now, this week, to talk about anti-Asian racism. Um, and also because the interviews show the pervasiveness of prejudice and the ways in which it was further activated and then uh, intersected with people's experiences of the pandemic. So the first excerpt is from a student at NYU of Chinese descent. She didn't grow up in China. She, she was adopted um, and has white parents. Her name is Leah Warner, and she might actually be with us today. I'm not sure. Um, but this was actually one of the first interviews that I carried out. Um, it happened in early April, right after she was in, evicted from her dorm at NYU. And in the aftermath of an incident where she was verbally attacked with racial slurs. Uh, and I think that's all I'll say just to give you context and we can play the excerpt, which is pretty short, so. Um, it's going to be interesting to like go back outside um, and walk around and see like, like, I don't know if things are going to change or go away or like if this is just a new sort of way that people are going to um like a new way that people are allowed to behave now I guess yeah. I don't know <laughs> yeah and so having like more sort of 
actively anti-racist discussions of COVID um, would be would be a good place to start. And then just having communities like defend each other. Um, <clears throat> like I know it's really hard right now because we're not allowed to be with each other, but um, like if we make it unacceptable for people to say or do things in public, um, mm -hmm. then hopefully they will do it less or stop. Um, and right now, like, like when the person said fucking chink to me, I didn't really react to or do anything because I didn't know what to do or say, but hopefully like if that were to happen again or happen to someone else, there would be like, I would know what to say. Thanks. So um, those words are pretty intense to hear. I just want to recognize that first off and maybe triggering for some people. Um, I really wanted to play this excerpt because it reflects the breakdown um, that people experienced, not just in terms of personal safety um, and in terms of health, uh, but actually a breakdown in the understanding of how people interact in public space. Um, for some people, the experience of racism uh, has been pervasive and uh, has lasted their entire lives. Um, I think this excerpt reflects a, a kind of lack of preparedness, um, not just in the pandemic context, but uh, in terms of the fallout uh, of a massive crisis like this uh, to the standards of interaction, how the pandemic exposed a lot of people who maybe hadn't been exposed before, uh, caught them unaware. So when she says, how are people going to be when we go back out? I think that's a really important question because that's actually where we are now a year later. How are we going to be when we go back out, right? Um, so I'm gonna shift just to a second excerpt and then we'll, um, and then Ryan will talk a little bit as well. Uh, and this is actually from a Taiwanese American narrator. Her pseudonym is Carol Chen and I interviewed her in late May and yeah, I think we can just jump straight into the excerpt. Anyway, I, I sent the mask to my parents and I told my mom, can you make some for yourself? It'll make me feel better. But I said, don't wear it yet, just in case. I'd rather you guys don't get attacked because um, I'm not there to protect you because I can go like ape shit <laughs> um, in case somebody were to ever like attack my parents because this yeah. has happened in the past where I, they, they've been discriminated against and I could go totally berserk and just, you know, um, protect them at all costs. But anyway, so I wasn't there. So I basically said, yeah, don't wear a mask at this point. Um, but then as things got worse um, and I asked them, are people wearing masks um, in ShopRite? Mm -hmm. And I said, when I say people, I don't mean people like you, but general public. So basically white people. Um, and they said, yes. So I said, okay, well then, can you start wearing your masks then? Because then you'll blend in. Because <laughs> then it's going to be the opposite effect. People are going to look at you like you're bringing the infection by not wearing a mask. So right. now that it's accepted, please wear right. a mask. Yeah. So then they did. Yeah. So it was very interesting, that dynamic in how my parents and myself rolled out how to wear, when to wear masks, when it was appropriate. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, so um, I think this this kind of experience of the anticipation of racism uh, goes beyond um, the Chinese American experience. Uh, and this excerpt is interesting to me, at least, because it um, it refers to just safety. What does it mean to be safe? What does it mean to be safe in a pandemic? And how does that actually intersect with um, the experience of racism? Um, what does preparedness, what does preparedness mean in this context? Um, so yeah, I think I, I will leave it there and then pass it on to Ryan, uh, who will continue on. 
Thank you so much, Denise. And again, I just want to echo what, uh, what you said about how wonderful it is to see the work of the Queen's Memory Project, and especially these photographs and the, the written excerpts. And I'm really looking forward to diving into the podcast as well. Um, so the, sh the clip that I'm going to share is actually two excerpts from an interview that I conducted in late April of 2020 with Alexandra Coria, who is a physician. And at the time that the pandemic hit, she was a pediatrician at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn. And she'd had some experience in global public health before this. She had served, uh, worked overseas in uh, tuberculosis clinics and had experience with infectious disease. And one of the reasons that this interview, uh, I think is so important and, and moving is that it she, in this interview very well describes the sense of disorientation and chaos in the hospitals as every patient turned into a COVID patient and as every physician became and nurse became someone who was treating COVID. Um, that the disease was suddenly everywhere before anyone had realized that, that it was everywhere and that the tests didn't seem to work properly all the time, that there were so many false negatives uh, and that we didn't understand even um, what kinds of, of PPE shortages there might be, you'll see her talk about. And so the disorientation kind of even extends to um, expressions of gratitude. She describes coming home uh, to hear the seven o'clock cheer that people were doing for medical workers and not feeling like that gratitude was properly placed for her, that she didn't feel like she could join in because she's it's for her, but at the same time, she feels like she's just doing her job, which is something that you hear her say a couple of times. Um, but also all of her friends are in this similar state of complete unsettledness. And she talks about the difficulty of everyone finding their footing in this unfamiliar new world, uh, which is especially difficult because everyone's situation is different and unique, but also because uh, under these conditions, we can't, or we couldn't, and I guess to largely we still can't, meet face to, face to face and work through our problems together and, and help each other out in the ways that we normally do. So um, I just like to play this clip and then we can talk about it again in, in just a moment. Have a tiny baby, a baby under um, 28 days. Anytime they have a fever, they get admitted to the hospital for observation. And so in a couple of these babies, they were totally fine. They were just being observed and they had had one fever. And um, most of those babies in the normal course of things will have no issue. They, we won't find an infection. They'll go home with their parents and they'll be fine. Um, those babies were turning up positive um, unexpectedly. So it was this really weird period where we were like, we don't know who's positive and negative. We don't know how to cohort these patients. We don't know how to keep people safe. And we don't know how to preserve PPE because we know that there are gonna be shortages down the line, but we don't know how severe they're gonna be. We don't even know what to wear for these patients because we don't know how this dis disease is spread. It was this very confusing, very stressful time. Um, and then counseling parents about, and that was when I first, I had my first like realization about the real socioeconomic disparity that was gonna be present here because we had a few families where we were saying, you know, you're positive. We had this one homeless family that we had to keep in the hospital for three days because her homeless shelter wouldn't take her home, take her back until the test resulted. Thank God it resulted negative, although now we know there are lots of false negatives. So honestly, she probably had COVID and was just false negative. And um but she ended up staying in the hospital in this isolation room for days and days because we couldn't discharge her to the community safely, what we thought of as safely. Although again, now with hindsight, we know COVID was just everywhere even then. So, but like, it was just this very, very stressful period of adjustment. And so like, just, this is just such an individual struggle for everybody and trying to figure out how I can be a support to my friends. And I think that, you know, being a medical worker in this time, everybody keeps reaching out to me, but I don't think that what I'm, I'm doing my job. Like I signed up for this. I knew, and especially as somebody that's worked in global health, like I have put myself in situation. I worked in a TB clinic for two years. Like I, I did this to myself. I know what I was getting. I knew what I was getting into. And this situation weirdly is what I was getting into when I went into medicine. Um, that is not 
a true even for all of my colleagues. And so every time somebody thanks me, I feel like it's misplaced because I'm just doing my job, exactly the job I signed up for, you know? And so that's weird. <laughs> and I don't think anybody is thanking the good parents enough, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's really hard. So we actually have Alexandra Korla here, mm -hmm. um, and I want to sort of invite her to jump in and say a few words if she'd like. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, hi. hi. Uh, I wasn't expecting that, but that's okay. <laughs> hi. I hope it's okay. I just want to give a, like a huge hand to you. Like, look at you, like doing the good work. My God. Um, yeah, well, um, it's interesting hearing myself uh, say those things because, um, oh, interestingly, I think that patient I was saying from the homeless shelter probably wasn't positive now that we know more about testing um, and what tests are positive and not. But I'm actually sitting here in my office with my colleague who uh, also worked on our COVID unit with me. And I know I'm this is activating a little bit of PTSD for me and I think for her as well. Um, oh. So it's, it's very interesting to hear myself talk. Um, I don't know if there are specific questions or anything, Ryan, that you would like me to address or. Other than just, you know, it's so good to see you again and I hope that you're doing well. <laughs> you too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, doing great. The COVID thing now has sort of become more routine, to be honest. I have a COVID patient I saw today, actually a very similar situation to what I was describing in that video with the baby who's there with some, like with just with a fever, very young baby. And now it just seems like, oh yeah, this is one virus in addition to other viruses that can cause these symptoms. I did lots of reassurance with the family. It was just a totally different interaction from what it had been um, back then. I'm glad to hear that it's becoming more routine and expectable, um, or rather, like kind of predictable. I guess. I mean, one of the one of the things that that was striking to me about this pandemic, um, particularly with people who had been who had experience with prior pandemics or with infectious disease or had been thinking about pandemics for a while, um, that even if you knew sort of generally um, that this kind of disaster was possible, when it actually arrives on your doorstep, um, there's nothing that really can prepare you for the kind of world that people um, were faced with and had to grapple with. And that, I think, was part of the trauma for people. But also just um, as, as uh, Alexandra, you describe in, in your um, interview, um, how difficult it is for people who um, aren't used to confronting a mortality um, are suddenly confronting it everywhere, even within the medical field, um, and that that's a that's a kind of underdiscussed, at least in the public sphere, part of the the trauma that medical workers have been going through in this pandemic. Yeah, a hundred percent. I'll maybe share a sort of silly anecdote, but that made me reflect on this. Um, just last week, I was watching like a dumb Netflix series. <laughs> You're going to learn a lot more about me right now. So I was watching a stupid Netflix series about a teenager. What was the series? Uh, <laughs> it was, um, what was it even called? It was about this group of, uh, this group of teenagers who like have special powers and live in a fairyland. And like, this is what I do to unwind. Um, so uh, one of them uh, has, um, you know, magical empathy. She can read people's emotions. And there's a scene where she, um, is at the bedside of somebody who's actively dying and uh, talking about how it's just too much. She can't be next to him. She can't, uh, you know, be a support for him. This person who she loves, who's dying because it's just too much for her. And that, just seeing that in this dumb Netflix series that otherwise I had no emotional connection to, brought back all of these images of adults that I treated uh, during the worst of the pandemic last spring. You know, people I couldn't save who weren't didn't have their uh people at the bedside and it just you know it comes up in unexpected ways that makes me realize that you know we all as a society and 
particularly healthcare workers and particularly healthcare workers who don't typically treat adults or don't trip typically treat um, critical illness, you know, we've all undergone a massive trauma and we'll see how that plays out in the future. I think, I think we're going to have a mass exodus of, you know, in the UK, we're already seeing this, this mass exodus of nurses from the NHS. And I think that it's going to change things for a lot of people. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming back to talk to us and answer these questions uh, rather unexpectedly. <laughs> yeah, it's so no sweet of you to jump in and, and sorry to put you on the spot like that. Oh, no, that's okay. Please, but just get on with the program. I'm sure there's much. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you for okay, having me. Okay, we can do yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but I guess I feel like for me, this brings up uh, something I've been thinking about a lot, which is that oral history interviewing as a methodology, like, um, is so unique, right? And in a way, so intimate and interpersonal. Um, would you say that, that this is correct? It seems so completely different from what like you think of as an interview in journalism, newsprint, other cultural productions. It seems to exist on a, on a completely different logic and one that is uh, kind of honors the embodied relationship. Brian, does that seem kind of correct? It's just so sweet to see the, the two of you like interacting like this. And I know it, you conducted like a number of interviews, right? We did two sessions together, yes. Mm -hmm. And it, it is a very personal and embodied methodology. And that's one of the reasons we were at first a little hesitant to do interviews remotely, although we really didn't have a choice because um, everyone, everyone was under a condition of lockdown when we first launched these interviews. And so we really had no choice. Um, but what we learned very quickly was that there was a certain kind of intimacy that was possible in these interviews because of how quickly the world had changed under the conditions of the pandemic that suddenly communicating with people through zoom or through uh any video software became much more normal and people were much more used to it and of course there was still some awkwardness to it but it becomes easier for people over the course of the pandemic to talk this way and it's also revealing in a sort of a way in which we're you know, both the interviewer and the interviewee are mutually disclosing to each other because we're in our each other's homes, basically. Um, and so there's a way in which you see into each other's lives in a way that you otherwise wouldn't necessarily. Um, and, you know, generally the way that we've structured these interviews for our project was to bring people from the past to the present to the future, to help walk them through, especially in the early stages of the pandemic, we were asking people about when they first became aware of this thing that we would understand to be COVID-19 and how they saw it approaching and what their life was like now and what they expected to happen in the future to kind of help them bridge this rupture in their experience of there was this pre-COVID life, there was COVID and then there's still COVID. I mean, there's, all, you know, COVID will always be with us, but what can we expect in the future? Um, and so, oftentimes at the end of an interview, it's really not uncommon for someone to say, this really felt like a therapy session. Thank you so much. Um, it was oftentimes the first time that someone that I spoke to, and I believe Denise has, will have this experience too. It was often the first time that one, that the person that I was speaking with had spent an hour thinking about the pandemic and thinking about talking through it with somebody in a way that wasn't just, you know, through a mask with your friend and neighbor saying, you know, talking about the difficulties of the pandemic, but really deeply reflecting on their experience. And so these interviews, I think, had uh, value to the people who are participating in them to just get some distance. This is something we've heard over and over again about how difficult it was to get distance from this event because it was everywhere and it was so intense for people. Denise, I don't know if you want to add to that. Sure. I mean, I think um, what I would say is that uh, one of the great benefits for us, especially as sociologists, but I think it, it was also a benefit for the people that we spoke with, is that uh, we were able to speak to people four months apart, six months apart. And um, when we read their first interviews and then listened to where they were in October, as opposed to April, um, we could understand the evolution of the pandemic and how people had transformed over this time. Uh, and it was really interesting because one of the questions that we asked in the second interview is, how have you changed 
since the beginning of the pandemic. And sometimes people didn't know. Uh, and sometimes it was evident to us from the interviews. And sometimes their idea of how they had changed was different from what was evident in the interviews. Uh, and all of that is in the material. So um, it, I just feel so lucky because it's it's a very, it's a rich resource for us and, and it will be for the public as well. Um, yeah, that's that's what I would add. Thank you. Um, I feel like there's a question or a, a trend emerging of talking about these intervals. Um, and I know, you know, Meryl, you, we, when we spoke last week, you'd also brought up that there's something very unique about trauma and memory in these kind of unique disaster situations that um, I guess prompts me to ask each of you, like, why was it so urgent to begin collecting these experiences immediately mid pandemic and then split it up in this way? Like what what are we gaining from doing that versus, you know, if we'd waited uh, six months after the pandemic wraps up and then we did these sort of recap interviews? I think for us, the urgency was clear that we were already in the dead eye of the pandemic. And um, I was speaking with some colleagues in the broader oral history field in those early weeks and um, Suzanne Snyder, who I'm sure some people here know from the oral history world, who's you know wonderful mentor of mine. She was interviewing somebody who doesn't typically work in an emergency medical setting, but found herself there. And she really wanted to participate in that interview because she knew that later they will say that it wasn't as bad as it really was. That sense of the brain processes trauma and we need to ease ourselves through these most difficult times of our lives. And um, you know what we've seen in the stories that have come our way and the interviews that we've recorded, you know, it really runs the gamut. There are some people for whom it was a welcome relief, like, oh, now I don't have to go to school and it's okay. Um, to people who are in the middle of the ICU settings. And so I think there's just so much value in having this broad sense of what was this year like for people, even if it's slices of time, even if it's a single photo with some text, um, it conveys something about that person's experience. And, um, you know, we don't have the capacity to do that sequential interviewing, but it's something that I really, you know, really deeply admire about your project, Denise and Ryan, and also with Columbia's 9-11 project. That was something that was heavy on my mind when we first launched our project, um, where people were interviewed after 9-11 at these regular intervals, and there was this collapsing of the personal memory into the collective that there's a narrative that eventually we start to remember by and you lose that specificity of what you experienced yourself yeah so, I think, yep. I'm sorry Mara. no no go ahead Lori as I was listening to to um Denise talk about how you had these sequential oral histories I was making notes it would be just so fantastic if we could follow up with even a few of our participants. And um, and I was wondering when, when you did go back and talk to them, did, did they listen to their initial interviews or was it just going into it cold or did they have the opportunity to reflect on what they said the first time or, or not? So we gave people a choice actually. So uh, they could listen or not listen. Most people did not listen uh, and some people we gave the transcripts to and they um, they read their transcripts or they skimmed them. Uh, for some people, it was very difficult to listen to their interviews. And there's one nurse in particular that I remember that I interviewed who during the second interview, when I asked her if she had had a chance to read her interview, just broke down and started to cry. So, yeah. Ryan, I think you had something. Oh no, it was just Denise and I have, have worked so closely together that we both started saying exactly the same answer. Um, so no, I don't have anything to add to that. We did give people an opportunity to go back and revisit their transcripts. Um, one of the things that we did, um, which I think was um, an important part of this project was that all of the interviewers themselves uh, were also interviewed. And so 
Um, I think that's good practice just in general as a sociologist also to uh, to participate in, in research projects so you see what it's like to be on the other end. It helps build empathy with with your research, with research participants, but it also gave us a sense of what it would feel like to read your own uh, transcript and be encountered by your past self. Um, and it's very strange. It's like, it's a profoundly strange experience. And you realize, for me anyway, I realized how much I had changed and how much more um, scattered actually I had become over the course of, and grayer also over the course of, of, the, of the pandemic. Um, I, I think that I was gonna, um, I'll leave it there, yeah. <laughs> no, that's such an interesting point though that I, I'm finding it hard to think even about how I've changed in the past year, but the change has been like landmark. It's like, it, it, it feels like five to 10 years have passed. Um, oh, I, I remember what just... I was gonna say if, if so I think it, the, the comparisons, the question originally was um, why was it so urgent for us to start these interviews early in the pandemic and about the sequential nature of it and um, the comparisons to 9-11 in particular. Um, one of the things that we really, wanted to do is to capture as much of the kind of pre-pandemic world as we could as people remembered it and that is that world is gone i mean people talk about going back to normal but i mean even if we go um i had the sense that this was going to go on for a very long time uh, from the very beginning and um and even if we are all vaccinated and everyone is able to go back to uh living their lives as they wish without any fear of the virus we're not going to go back to the world of 2019 that that social world is gone and something will replace it that is maybe familiar or similar but it's gone so we wanted to document that and we wanted to capture the way that people were making sense of this strange world as it was happening um and in particular this strange temporality of it of how stretched out it was um, the 9-11 experience is a punctuated and acute moment of disaster that had repercussions and echoes for decades for, for many people. Um, but this was a disaster that not even everyone realized was happening at the same time. Um, didn't even realize that it had begun at the same time and that it will end for different people at different times. And um, you know, it's not uncommon for people in the disaster studies community to talk about this as if you know, it's as if 9-11 were happening, but it, it took three months from the time that the first plane hit the tower to the time the second one, the second tower collapsed. Um, so the, the kind of extreme telescoping of this crisis is something that is unusual for disasters, but also unusual, I think, for people's experiences. And so it's one of the reasons we wanted to capture it uh, sequentially over time. That's so intriguing. I, I was wondering if you could sort of flesh out, and this uh, question is for, in, in actually everyone, if you could flesh out the aspects of our sort of pre-pandemic world that you think won't be coming back or which, uh, you know, now are kind of relics of a historic past. Like I can think of some examples, but I'm curious to know what yours are as the experts. Um, coming from the, the college perspective, I think there's a real question of will we ever go back to fully completely in-person learning and, and i know that that's a question being addressed by educators at every level but um, at the college level there's this sort of expectation of like well now that we know how to do remote learning um do we all come back to campus is, is you know what is what is the value of that and and there are many many different answers to that uh, clearly, there, there is a great value for some and in some respects being back on campus, but it has also opened up opportunities for people to take classes and in ways that they never could before. Um, and I think we're at the college are, are trying to negotiate with what is this going to, what will education look like in the future for us and, and certainly for the, the public schools. It, it's undoubtedly going to be different and I don't think we know exactly how yet. Yeah, um, I'm also in a university setting and so uh, definitely share that. I think something important to think about, um, which is related to the pandemic but goes beyond the pandemic and is also related to the time before the pandemic, is that um, the crisis in itself put 
so many aspects of our society, so many failings of our society under a magnifying glass. And um, we were just uh, two months, I think, into um, our oral history interviewing when um, the Black Lives Matter movement took off um, after the murder of George Floyd um, and, and many others, but especially after that. And we realized that we could no longer talk to people just about the pandemic. I mean, I think we had realized that before, but in this particular instance, um, it became really important to understand everything else that was happening around us. Uh, and in, in some interviews, Black Lives Matter actually became the center of, of the interviews. Um, and so there is a world before the pandemic where maybe a lot of people um, had less of a sense of the inequities uh, that we face as a result of socioeconomic status, uh, as a result of race, uh, as a result of other uh, demo demographic uh, and social aspects of our lives. And that doesn't really exist in the same way anymore. I think there's, and this may be a positive thing, I hope it is, more of an understanding of what doesn't work in our society. Um, there's also more divisions than there were before, and that's something concerning. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's it's important to recognize that any conversation about the pandemic really is encompasses so much more. I think and this is also something that we talk about a lot in disaster studies about the idea that um, most that, you know, the mantra for so many people in a crisis becomes, I just want things to go back to normal, but there are a lot of terrible things about normal. Um, and you don't always wanna go back to normal and you don't wanna go back to this pre-disaster world. And I think one of the things that is going to be extremely important for people to look at and keep an eye on as, as the pandemic starts to recede um, is that the recovery is equitable and that we don't, that we don't go back to normal in ways that are harmful to people and exacerbate inequalities. And that is um, something that is going to take a lot of sustained effort and activism for people's on people's parts. And to the point that Denise made about divisions too, it, there's this idea that, you know, oftentimes in crises and especially punctuated crises, um, there's a consensus around what the problem is and how we can work together to, to solve it or that we've all experienced the same um, kind of crisis. And um, in the US, uh, the coronavirus pandemic has been a contentious crisis. Not everyone, it became a point of political contention and division about just the nature of this thing and whether or not it even, it even existed and what we were supposed to do to stop it or to live through it or to survive through it. And so that is um, a particularly unnerving aspect of this that I think is gonna have ramifications for a long time to come. And I'll just add um, to Denise's point about the magnifying glass that's been applied to so many problems in our society and in our culture in this country. Um, and to Alexandra's point earlier too about just the mass exodus of health professionals in the UK that what is the normal that people are able to go back to? Um, it's completely uneven. And I'll mention by way of example, Queen's Memory is part of a coalition of organizations that or have been working together for months now on um, the East Elmhurst and Corona recovery. Um, those are two neighborhoods that were especially hard hit. And in one elementary school, more than 100 students have lost one or both parents. That's one school. And it, it, there, there are no words for something like that. So I saw a question pop up in the chat about, um, sorry, I'm sort of losing my, my thought here, but um, in, in any case, uh, I, I think we need to, to Ryan's point just now about the recovery being an equitable one, just really pay attention and be really mindful and help wherever we can um, 
And I think the question was, where do we see the endpoint for our project? So I may be jumping ahead a little bit, but I think this project for us, there is no endpoint. I think many people who were not able to participate for all kinds of reasons this last year, I hope that we will be able to welcome them when they feel ready to share their stories. And I don't think that's going to happen in the next months or even in the next year or two. So our collection will remain open for possibly in perpetuity, who knows. Thank you for that. Um, I guess my follow up question is sort of your, it'll be open in perpetuity, but looking to the the beyond the immediate future, 10 years out, 20 years out, um, you know, long after vaccines have been rolled out, uh, you know, what do you kind of forecast as or hope to be the role of this archive that you're building in the in the current moment? Like what role can are you anticipating it will play? And this is a question for, for everyone here. I know we're at the beginning stages of these projects, but um, I can I can speak briefly for our project. Um, our original plan, and this is still our plan, was to do three interviews, and we haven't gone into the third phase yet. We wanted to wait until the pandemic was behind us to talk to people uh, and to have people think retrospectively about what they experienced. Um, but once the material is public, and it's it's going to be public through the Columbia University Library Oral History Archive, uh, what we hope is that um, it will motivate people to work with the material, uh, either researchers, social scientists like me and Ryan, uh, oral historians, or artists who can use the material in order to um, not just share it out, but engage with it. Uh, the idea, and I, I think this came from Amy Sarcheski, uh, who we've been working very closely with, who's one of the co-directors of the project, is to create a sort of dialogic archive where there's a conversation happening. Uh, we want it to be alive. We want to hear it. And we want to hear other voices in conversation with it, I think that would be the best possible thing, uh, especially thinking toward a future where these kinds of crises that we're facing are going to become um, more and more common, unfortunately. I think there's a lot to learn from that, so. Uh, yeah, if I could just um, jump in on that idea. Um, um, Queen's memory itself um, will, will continue, but as far as the, the COVID-19 project, I, I agree. We were hoping that these materials can be used and um, particularly in, in, in an artistic way. We were already um, working with the theater group, the, um, I, I believe their name is, what would the neighbors say, theater group? And they are gonna be at Queens College, hopefully in the fall working with theater classes. And their idea is to use some of this material and, and other um, primary sources uh, around COVID-19 to develop um, a play uh, based on this, uh, uh, kind of reflecting on other pandemics that New York has been through uh, through this one. So that's just been the very early stages, but we're very excited about uh, working with um, artists and, and writers like that. Oh, that's incredible. I love that. Um... I guess, yeah, uh, to Denise's point, I wanted to ask, like, or I don't know if this is a question, but th the like afterlife and the effects of the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, um, like especially in New York City, it's, it's remarkable the degree to which we did not know how much the remnants of that pandemic shaped everything around us. Um, and I feel like this is something that I've been thinking about and everyone around me has been talking about for basically the past year, like, Currently, I'm sitting next to a radiator in my, you know, pre-war apartment, and like these radiators were like designed to overheat because they had to heat, you know, apartments during that pandemic with all the windows open. And I feel like this whole year we've been attending to such a roster of events of how that one worldwide phenomenon impacted literature, culture, like novels of the period, um, all of this history and all of this like impact that trickled down to us that. Uh, I, I couldn't have anticipated at all. 
Um, and I guess I'm wondering, do you think that this will have the same level of cultural impact? It's really hard to say because we're still living yeah. through it, I think, right? I mean, it, and it's interesting because it's like the 1918 flu pandemic is influential, but it's influential in the context of the cholera epidemics that swept through New York City before that. And, and um, all of the other epidemics that have hit New York City, someone in the comments was talking about uh, the flu pandemic of 68 to 70. We can think about the way that polio shaped this country, we can think about whether the HIV AIDS crisis shaped this country and all, and all around the world, right? Um, the way that the Ebola outbreaks have been shaping uh, have been shaping East and West Africa, like the, the you know pandemics and epidemics and emerging infectious diseases have been with us and continue to be with us all the time, um, and you know it's it's difficult to to trace all of the ways in which they have cultural impacts and the way that they change the way that we think about about the world, and it's especially difficult when they're still happening. And you know, again, even when, when the pandemic is over, so to speak, here in the US, um, the inequality of the vaccine distribution around the world is such that the pandemic will be going on for years everywhere else. And so I, um, it's, I don't know, I, I'm very cautious about making any projections, um, in part also because, again, of the experience of 9-11 of and all of the different ways we thought the world would change um, and, and the, reality of those changes were always different than what we expected in one way or another. Yeah, makes sense. I guess in closing, I, I just have to ask, um, you know, I feel like everyone has sort of alluded in some way to the fact that we have had different kinds of societal shifts happen uh, over the last year. And I'm sort of wondering, I mean, I sort of iconically, Arundhati Roy wrote this piece in like the Washington Post or someplace about how pandemics can serve as a portal, can serve as a way to imagine and conceptualize like different ways of living. And I was wondering if you, you know, as the experts have felt that that has been happening or have been seeing that to some degree that there are, you know, or do you feel that people are rethinking their place in society in a way that perhaps we want to keep? It's a bit of a leading question. I can speak to that briefly. Um, sure. I have interviewed a lot of people involved in mutual aid efforts in New York City. Uh, and it just so happens that uh, those people seemed to be doing better early on in the pandemic because they had found ways of continuing their engagement with their communities, um, whether remotely or in person. Uh, and there was a lot of hope among people doing mutual aid work, uh, but also among organizers in the early stages of the pandemic, where it seemed like a lot of barriers were coming down. For example, suddenly it became easier um, to get people out of prison. Uh, a lot of the barriers that had been in place became more flexible or, or, or seemed um, almost to dissipate in the context of those first weeks. Um, and then unfortunately, I would say that in the second wave of interviews, a lot of those people who had been very hopeful had lost their hope. And, you know, you can attribute this to just the, the fatigue, the incredible fatigue of um, having lived in this for so long. Uh, but it, it seems like after the, the most acute stage of the pandemic, um, a lot of the systems, the institutions that we know, the bureaucracies that are in place fell back into place more or less. And I think that's a lesson about um, sort of the volatility of, a, of, of a, a moment of acute social distress uh, and the potential of those kinds of moments. And certainly a lot of change can happen in those moments. The question is, how, how do we sustain it? How do we take what we know or how do we take the hopes that emerged in those really, really dark moments uh, and carry them through past the point of everything falling back into place or, or you know, things at, at least attempting to fall back into place. Um, people want to go back to normal, but maybe normal is not what we want. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's a lesson there. If that answers your question, I hope it does. I think it does. Um, and I think this is a beautiful place perhaps to open it up to audience questions. Um, so Anya, if you would like to take over. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Anya, project, production assistant at The Rail. Um, I'm gonna be moderating the Q&A. Um, actually, the first question, I hope this all right, um, comes from me. It's, it's something I've been thinking about a, a lot recently. Um, and uh, I think you probably all have a unique perspective on it. I've just been thinking about how we've um, been able to adapt and adjust to, to living in a pandemic. This kind of, uh, I think especially a year in, uh, a lot of people have been reflecting on like the eeriness of how normal it is. Like I was just on the train yesterday and like had a kind of sinking feeling <laughs> sitting there, realizing what, we're in this crowded space, all wearing masks. And that's just like how we interact with each other now. And it's, I don't know, I don't know how a year ago, like we were so scared of the subway, you know, or at least I was, and now I, I ride it. Um, and so just thinking about how we've shifted, it seems from fearing the virus itself as this abstract thing, like we understand more how it works. And now we're kind of addressing and bracing against like the social and economic tragedies that have come with the pandemic and our pandemic response and the, the government's negligence. Um, you know, thinking about the effects of isolation on children and the rise in overt racism um, and violence. And so when putting together these archives, like what has been the most noticeable shift in perspective for you um, from those early days to now? And maybe thinking about what the issues are that people seem to be focusing on um, besides just like fearing the virus itself or, and obviously the, the effects of the virus have shifted as well, like how, um, uh, the health response has shifted, but yeah, maybe the, the most noticeable or um, yeah, jarring shift you've seen. I, I think COVID fatigue, as mentioned earlier, is very real. And the fact that we're able to sit in a subway train and still everyone is wearing masks, I always take that as a real gesture of care that we are still wearing these masks to protect ourselves, but especially those around us. But um, in, in the archive, you know, submissions have tapered off a bit. I think now with the one year marker being on so many of our minds, we'll see if, and we're inviting people to kind of reflect on what they submitted a year ago and tell us how they've been doing since then, you know, kind of react to what they submitted a year ago. But I think a clear trend once we got past the, those initial very terrifying months was the coping, all the ways that we need to cope with how we're living. Um, and it can be tiring, it can be kind of joyful in a way, depending that there are new ways to connect with people and um, to have those relationships that otherwise may not have existed. I think that's been definitely one of the, the best parts of this experience. Um, but that, at least on the archival side, that's what I've noticed. Um, I think a lot of people's faith in institutions was really shaken by this. Uh, you really can't disentangle the pandemic from the kind of political world, both um, people's kind of faith that that it couldn't get this bad uh, that like something like this wouldn't be able to happen um for some people that was a real trend that comes to the fore uh, especially in the second interviews um and um that again collides with the experience that people have that um of overt discrimination and kind of structural racism that had obviously existed before this but just that didn't abate, but in many ways became worse under the pandemic. That was crushing for a lot of people and was a, a difficult change to watch as people go through the process. Um, and just the the sense of, of just ongoing and profound isolation for people was, was a big shift that we saw over the course of the pandemic that um, in the first wave of interviews, um, especially early on, um, people, a lot of times had come up with little workarounds like they would you know put on their their shoes to work from home as if that was part of the structure of their day like this marks when i'm in my job and this and when i take my shoes off at the end of the day um and at the by the end of the by the second wave a lot of those routines had fallen apart and it just people you know started to crumble under the kind of long duration of this thing um but there's also kind of more 
more positive and hopeful things that that happened as well that people um started seeing that a new world is possible and that if everything can fundamentally and suddenly change that it can change for the better um, if we keep working for it and so that that has been something interesting and enlightening to see i think something also that um just to touch on it is the how this has highlighted the technology divide has been really striking um, to me and, and to a lot of people. And, and whereas a lot of us have adapted and found ways to do the things that we used to do in a different way through technology, um, for a lot of people are being left behind by that. And you see that even now with the vaccine rollout, I know here in New York, it's been pretty much done through online sources. And a lot of people have been finding it very difficult to get appointments if they don't have those technology skills. And it's it's um, unfortunate and I hope something that we can continue to address going forward of how to bridge that technology divide, um, both economically and just experientially. That, that's been a constant theme, I think. Thank you so much um, for those answers. Um, our next question uh, comes from G.E. Schwartz. And you should be able to unmute. Okay, hi. Thank you so much for, the, for building these wonderful resources, which I know are gonna be a great healing and also help us to, to rebuild later on um, in so many ways. Um, my question is, is, is almost a, a bit of a sociology one or ethnomethodology, the, uh, the question of interactive practices kind of question. Are the categories like death from COVID-19 and infected with uh, coronavirus, are they as much social constructions as they are um, related to the brutal biological facts of illness and death? Maybe it's yeah, sociology. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think that's absolutely the case. I mean, one of the fascinating, I mean, you know, one of the horrifying things of the early part of the pandemic is that oftentimes people were dying of, um, you know, heart of cardiovascular failure or things that were consequences of COVID, um, but couldn't be categorized as COVID because it was too early or there weren't testing. And, and so there's, there, um, or again, you know, people who would come into a hospital with an altered mental state, um, but no clear respiratory issues, but that's because of the slow hypoxia that this disease can cause where people's blood oxygen levels dip for prolonged periods of time before they're out of breath, which is actually relatively rare, or at least it it's a, appeared to be rare. And so there's this gigantic kind of socio-technical apparatus of being able to detect COVID in the world as a thing, and then to be able to say that so-and-so is or is not infected of it with it and is or has not died from it. Um, and that's, that's, you know, even to the extent that we're talking about these variants, as if, you know, this is a, an, an important part of the COVID experience. This is really the first global pandemic in which we've been able to do genetic surveillance uh, of a disease as it spreads around the world. And that, you know, the, the problem of the variants is a problem that we're socially constructing, even though it obviously exists in the world, like the genes of this virus are shuffling around. Um, but we're able to detect those things and put a name to them and exchange ideas about them and knowledge about them because of the, this network of devices and experts and uh, infrastructure for communication and for stabilizing ideas about science and society um, that just wouldn't have been available to, to earlier um, to, to people in, you know, say the 1918 flu pandemic, for example, which of course they thought was bacterial and not viral, right? So, I mean, the, all of this is, is socially constructed to a certain sense. Thank you. But also biological, sorry, yeah, <laughs> of course. I would just add to that, that um, you, you can learn about that from listening to some of the interviews we've done with people, um, uh, with virologists, epidemiologists, and so on. Uh, but something really fascinating about this archive is that 
uh, people are talking about something that's invisible to them. And in that sense, it reminds me a little bit about a little bit of um, Svetlana Alexievich's work uh, on Chernobyl, where people are describing radiation and, and failing at doing so, um, people of all kinds of different levels of education. And we see that as well in this instance, it's uh, the lack of information or the, um, the instability of the information um, and the invisibility we see transforms people's relationships to each other, but also to the material world around them. And that from a sociological perspective, that's absolutely fascinating, so. Thank you for that excellent question and those answers. Um, unfortunately, we have to, to start closing out. So our, our final question uh, will be from a very own Nick Bennett. Um, thank you, Anya, and thank you, everyone, for, for being here today. And um, this has felt sort of very grounding in a way, um, just considering where we are right now and where we were a year ago. Uh, my question kind of popped in my head when um, Alexandra, <laughs> sorry, dog, um, when Alexandra said the word <laughs> magical empathy. Uh, I wanted to know what the best or most ideal outcome would be for this project, and if there's maybe a wildest dream of how this could expand. I'm going to mute myself, sorry, for the dog. My cat has been sitting in front of my microphone for half of this time, so Nick, I totally um, sympathize with you about that. But I'm not going to answer your, your, your wonderful question yet, because I have to think about it, and I'll let someone else jump in first. We're in a borough of two plus million people. And I think between the Queens Public Library's 65 branches and Queens College and the CUNY system at large, I would guess that almost everybody in this borough has some connection to these institutions. And my wildest dream maybe would be, let's do a mass scale oral history matching where all of <laughs> every resident of this borough would be able to have their voice reflected in our collection. Um, I can dream. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, I really just hope that we're able to follow up with people. Of course, we're, we're working on a third wave of interviews and I kind of have this idea that we could continue on with people for a long time after that. Um, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of Apted's um, Seven Up series. Um, and as, as, a, as a way of thinking about how, what the long afterlife of this pandemic is going to be in people's lives, um, to be able to interview everyone again every, six years would be seven years would be phenomenal um but also you know as as someone who was until very recently a graduate student i have this like dream that you know 100 years from now someone goes back and listens to all of these interviews or reads the transcripts and learn something about this time and the trauma that people went through um and learn something and that we're able to kind of reach into that future and change it yeah i think for me um it's, it's especially important for people to talk with each other and listen to each other across difference. And I think these materials, and I think the, the Queen's Memory Project does this as well. Uh, we had a lot of discussions with a team of interviewers about um, who would interview whom and uh, whether it made more sense for um, an immigrant to interview an immigrant uh, woman to interview another woman and so on, or what what could be gained from um, talking across all kinds of different um, variations. And we didn't come to a conclusion about that, but if nothing else, the archives actually give people an opportunity to listen across all kinds of different experiences. And um, that's what we need right now, I think, uh, uh, for people to really be able to put themselves in other people's shoes as much as possible in order to create the kind of um, solidarity and empathy that's necessary to overcome a pandemic, a global pandemic. So that's my wildest hope or dream for this material. Thank you so much for sharing that. 
Um, it's so interesting to think about like who gets to interview who and you know how to be able to have those conversations across difference because it reminds me so much of the meeting we were having just before this event uh, at the Brooklyn Rail we were talking about the exact same you know these questions of identity politics and uh, closeness and experience um, and you know like myself personally I feel like it's very interesting how in this past year those kinds of questions of like representation um, and you know the unique and embodied experiences of like certain voices right uh, and that being like a valued asset to for instance an interview like I feel like that uh, that dialogue emerged in this past year in the media landscape um, like on every scale uh, in a way that I've never seen before and I you know it's so interesting to think like perhaps this will be something we think about you know when Ryan's uh, graduate student 100 years from now looks back and like views the conversation. Um, but uh, thank you all so much for your wild generosity of time with your projects, with your words. Um, I'm aware I've kept you a couple minutes over, so we'll, we'll try and keep it quick. Um, so at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending with poetry. Uh, and today I'm thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Connie May Oliver, to the stage, the proverbial Zoom stage. Connie Mae Concepcion Oliver. Uh, she's a poet and an artist living in New York, and her book, Science Fiction Fiction, was published just last year by Scruton Duville Press. And please, Mr. Postman, a very compelling title, uh, and an illustrated book dedicated to her late friend, the musician Christopher Pabon, is forthcoming this year from the same press. Uh, Connie, take it away and everyone give it up for Connie Mae Oliver. You should be able to unmute yourself, but let me just check that you can. Hello. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm going to share Please Mr. Postman, which uh, started off as a poem um, dedicated to my friend who passed away at the height of the pandemic last year. And then it became an illustrated book. And um, I thought I would read the poem and show you the illustrations at the same time. This is my friend, Christopher Pabon. Read to me from your own personal Dianetics, the shaded, unexpected minor chords, the ones that keep asking and are sad the Amen chords won't answer. Read to me from the mostly unattended, perfect attendance dinner. Pavon taught me to hold B, then turned around and walked back up to the air. He drew a white dot on my forehead and said, I theft. I keep dreaming that he's upstairs, waving from the window with his bracelets and rings, that he's coming down to open the door. Waving from up there, round the way, a hard day's night, wrapping the mezcal worm in a bar napkin like a tiny mummy. Pabon said, Connie, what is your actual deal? As I unlocked the Ford hatchback, annoyed. Stop giving my number to your friends, man. Where's my favorite pink blazer? Don't make me call the macaroni grill on you. Don't make me page Tony Roma. When we put blue eyeshadow on each other, we were like, yo, we have cute eyes. We could be primos. That's, um, that's Carl Sagan. We just both really like Carl Sagan. In this infomercial for a doodad that gets stuff out from behind the couch, do we call them actors or reenactors? Do they go to the reenactor auditions? Has anyone ever loved ducks as much as people in the 80s and 90s? Has anyone ever been smarter than a newborn? Remember when you called every bald guy you saw Picard? Hopping the turnstile, talking about fuck Daniel Day Lewis. Siempre está gritando, like, we'll move through the mind if that's what you want. We'll buy the off, off, off brand Henny and play Mariah Carey on YouTube if that is what you want. Uh, 
I'll come get you like Elliot running through the white plastic tube in his high-waisted jeans. I'll hide you in the basket of my VMX, the moon now behind us. Wait, te mando esta carta, one last stuff now to remember us by. The envelope jumps through the screen, rushes across Elmhurst Avenue before it's too late. The wind lifts it away. You're a pilot now. I cover my eyes to see you. No te olvides de mí, tu prima. Thanks. My gosh, honey, what a beautiful like eulogy and love poem. Thanks. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I had no idea it was going to be like that. I love that so much. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you so much to you, Meryl. Thank you, Lori, Denise, Ryan, uh, all of you for agreeing to come on, you know, with a week's notice and being so generous with your words and your minds. Uh, and of course, thank you so much to you who tuned in today in the audience and in the chat. We're celebrating the Rails 20th anniversary this year. It's the year's, it's the world's longest birthday party. Uh, we're celebrating all year. So as a nonprofit, if you enjoyed today's program, please consider making a donation to keep the rail and our special projects free, relevant, and independent. And please join us again tomorrow for a tribute to curator Barbara Rose, featuring Kate Bonansinga, Douglas Dreshpoon, uh, Jack Flam, Sam Gillian, Alison Delima Green, Gary Tinfero, and Phyllis Tuchman in conversation with rail publisher, our very own Fong H. Bui. And that will be, as always, at 1 p.m. right here in the Zoom. Uh, other than that, you can now, you know, turn on your microphones uh, and, you know, say goodbye on your way out or whatever you'd like. But this was so beautiful. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Malvika, for hosting us. Yeah. yeah thank, thank you, Malvika. Thank you so much. Yeah. I hope thank it was okay. Connie. It was wonderful. Thank you all, thank you all so much. Thank you, Ryan. In a way. Really thank you, appreciate. Corey. Thank you, Denise. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining. Can I also us. say something about everyone's backgrounds? Like, there's such an intimacy to like seeing into people's houses, virtual backgrounds, their dog, their cat, <laughs> and you know, it's like a discomfort, but it's like been lovely to share the Zoom space with this group of people, who I'm like happy to invite into my my home. Um, it's been really nice. I hope we all like stay in touch. I'm really excited about both of your like infinite sets of projects and Great. yeah, I hope so we stay we've connected. All, we've all met my right. now, so. <laughs> my Should we, uh, Sophia's showing us a cactus. I don't have any pets, but you can all see my cactus. <laughs> um, should we break for lunch? I'm hungry. <laughs> Again, everyone. All right, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.